Today I'm going to talk about uh, the lie that Satan gives us that uh, you don't have what it takes. Right? And I'm going to share some personal stories here a little bit, but um, in the beginning here, we're, we're just going to be, there's some lies that we believe as, um, as people that, that's, that just seems like it's, it's been uh, maybe a truth that we were told and it becomes, a, it's actually a lie, but over our whole lives we've been told this, we begin to believe it. For instance, um, how many know that after you eat something you can't go swimming for, what, 30 minutes or an hour? Who's ever heard that? You eat, you eat lunch, you eat dinner, and then you're not supposed to go swimming, right? And because, why? What's going to happen if you do? You're going to get cramps, right? Has anybody ever got a cramp swimming? It's not ever, it's not a proven theory. It's just something that our grandfathers and grandmothers told us, our moms told us, everybody's told us, but if you, it's, it's not true. I mean, I even researched some of this. Believe it or not, Google has a lot of information, right? You can't, you don't get cramps after you, but why do, why do parents tell their kids, don't go swimming? And, and, and matter of fact, some of you probably don't even believe me now because it's been told for so long that it's just like one of those things like, no, it's, this is a truth, but it really is not a truth. It's technically a lie, right? So we've been, it's something we've been told all the time. Like, um, uh, one of the other ones that he uh, mentioned was, um, how about eating carrots are good for what? Your eyes. Eating your eyes, right? So that's not been proven medically either. So, but how many believe that? Eat your carrots, kid, because you got you have good eyesight. Because why? We want our kids to eat vegetables; they're good for you, right? But they're not. We got to give them a reason for that. And really, so how many told, been told that when you're a kid? Eat carrots. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, because like Andy's pointing the mom over here. Like, yeah, you know, because we've been told that. Now, I didn't do all the research on it, but I found out where this kind of the history of this. Like, you can look up everything, right? So, actually, it was a. This came from World War II. It's when radar first came out, and there was this lie told because they didn't want the enemy or the world to know they had radar. They're actually pinpointing where these missiles were or these bombs were landing. So they, they made this lie that um, that the reason our pilots are, are they have good vision because they eat a lot of carrots. That's where they came from. Can you believe that? So that's the truth. And then you know then we see that on uh, Disney picked that up. So Bugs Bunny, right? So everybody you know Bugs Bunny's eating a lot of eat, uh, carrots and he can see really good. And so now we tell our children the same thing because we found it on, we watch it on a cartoon and now it becomes truth, but it's really a lie, right? So sometimes we have we live like that in ourselves. Um, we're not lies. Lies become these things become truth because we hear them over and over and over again, right? We hear it over and over again that if you eat a lot of carrots, it's true. So even today, or if you get cramps from swimming, it's just, it becomes almost it becomes truth to us because we hear it all over and over and over again. And so we're going to get into some personal stuff today. I'm going to share a story about myself. I'm going to share some, some story about, from our missional community and how, how we believed the lie for so long and that how we, it hindered us from actually doing the things of God. So we're, we're told over and over again that we're not good enough. We're not worthy enough. We don't have what it takes to do what God calls us to do. And so we always strive trying to be better than what we really are. But before we get into that, I want to share with you, if you will, the, the scripture, uh, we, in our missional community, we've been doing this lately. We've been saying things about truth, but we've been actually opening up our Bibles and actually showing where that scripture is. So let's do that today, too. Let's go to John chapter uh, 8. I want to show you about this, this lying Satan that, that tells us these untruths all the time. And, and just know that he's always, um, never, there's no truth in him at all. So verse, chapter 8 of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And now we're going to go verse 44. And it's talking about uh, the children of the devil. And maybe I'll go verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. Talking about Jesus himself. For I came from God, and no, uh, and not, now am he here. I have not come on my own, but he has sent me. Why? Is my language not clear to you? 
And because you are unable to hear what I say, you belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out what your father desired, that your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Talking about Satan. Satan was always a murderer from the beginning, okay? Not holding to the truth. There's no truth in the enemy. Amen? Let's we'll share that just a little bit, show you that. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks to his native language, for he is a liar and a father of lies. So every time the enemy speaks to you, he's lying. So how does that work? So sometimes you have a thought, maybe I'm not good enough for something, right? Maybe um, I've had some father wounds. Maybe some things that happened in my past to me, it, it, it made me believe that I'm lesser a person than I really am. Because if we remember, we have a base here at Capital City, we said, uh, we are... In Matthew 20, it says, We are baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember, we, most of you know that. Some of you that are new to haven't heard that in uh, no, uh, But we're baptized in the Father because we're a family, right? And we believe that we're a family. Father God is our Father. So we have words. We, we're sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen? Mm -hmm. we're, we're part of His family. So, I mean, the, the inheritance that Jesus has is your inheritance. That's pretty amazing, right? You are His children. You're His daughter. Son. I want to congratulate Megan. For being here this morning, because Megan worked till four o'clock in the morning. There's no excuse for not being here on time because Megan was here. I just I just thought I'd throw that out this morning. So maybe thank you for being here, Megan. <laughs> so if anybody had an excuse not to be here this morning, I think it's Megan. But anyway, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. So uh, the thing is, uh, um, and that could be even a lot. But anyway, the, let me get back on track. Jesus, the, the Satan will never tell you the truth about anything about yourself. And it always causes you to want to do something yeah. more or better or strive to do something different than you can just accept the fact that you're his children. Do you earn your right to be called sons and daughters of God? How do you earn that? How do we even get that title? Because God in Psalms, we got that from the very beginning. So now we're his sons and daughters because he chose us. You and me. Yeah. He chose you from the beginning. That's pretty powerful. Yes. I'm going to get off track a little bit. but And then we choose him. And accept his narrative for our lives instead of what the enemy has for us. Amen? Man, I just want to end the service right there. John, let's go to John 8, uh, 31 and 32. Let's go back a little bit and read uh, the truth about what Jesus did for us. It says, to the Jews and to who, who has believed him, Jesus Christ, if you hold to my teachings, you are re really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will what? set you free. Set you free, right? So we have to flip the script a little bit. The enemy tells us one thing. That we're not children of God, we're no good, we've sinned, we did things wrong, and God says, no, you are my children, I love you, and I care for you, amen? Or how about like your marriage, how many married people we have here, you know, man, God gave me a horrible wife. No, that's not true. You know, but the enemy will say, look at, look, look what she did, or look what he did, or how could he be like that? The enemy always will throw that stuff at you, and then you gotta say, no, no, God appointed and gave me a jewel that's precious. Amen? A crown. In my crown is her jewel. It's, it's Tina, right? She's my precious jewel that God gave to me. Amen? And then we look at it. No, Satan, well, I don't believe that. I don't believe what the world says. I don't believe the commercials and the TV and all the stuff they say about marriage. That's, all that lie that, that comes through the, the media is just craziness, isn't it? Against the husbands, against the wives. The wives aren't good. They have to perform a certain way. You know, I don't, I don't know how many wives wear high heels every day, but it's like every commercial, every wife has high heels on and, you know, dressed in this fancy little dress. I mean, that's just not reality, right? But it's an image that we see, and all of a sudden we have to try to strive to be like that lie. And you know what it does? It causes confusion and heartache in our lives. When you can just, God just wants you to be who you are. Amen? 
who you are. Who are you? You just Bob and Tina, right? We love each other for a long time. And no matter what the enemy throws at us, we're not going to accept that lie. Amen? Or work. How about work? He said, i got to be the best. I have to earn the most. I have to do all these things. How, how many of you have just been satisfied at work? Like, just go to work and do your job and be happy. Who's ever done that? Has anyone in this room done that yet? Like, just show up to work happy and just like, hey, I'm going to do my best for God. And I'm not going to care about trying to do, you know, better myself, uh, better or, or cut down another person or step over somebody. I'm just going to do my job because I'm doing it all. This is the difference now. I'm doing it all for the glory of God. I remember that day when I, I read that scripture verse that said, I should do everything for the glory of God. I mean, I was working hard. I was trying to, it's been a long time since I actually had a job where I got paid, like, uh, you know, work for somebody. Like, but I remember those days. And I wanted to be the best, right? I wanted to be the best. So I looked the best. I dressed the best. I was on, always early for work, right? Because I was, you know, I wanted to get promoted. But then all of a sudden, the, the script flipped for me. I remember reading the scripture that says, oh, I'm going to do everything for the glory of God. So that next day, I remember that morning, I read that. That day I went into work. I said, okay, now everything I'm doing, I'm doing for the glory of God. Amen. And I did my work well, and I did what I had to do well, but I didn't, there was no pressure trying to outdo anybody else. I was just doing it for God. And I was, I was, what I was sharing a story with this week. Uh, somebody, but anyway, I share that the day that um, in in the military you get uh, what we call a, a fitness report. So once a year you get evaluated, and on that evaluation is so powerful that if you get a bad report, that you might not get promoted the next time promotions are due. I mean, it's very very critical that you know you do well on that. But I wasn't thinking about that. I was just doing my job for unto God, right? And I got called in the office, and, and in the military, you have to report to your officer, right? So I had to go in there, real sharp-like, and uh, uh, stand in front of his desk and report in. Uh, Sergeant Castro reporting, sir, and blah, blah, blah. And, and did the nice to things, and then he handed me my fitness report. And he knows fitness report time, yes, sir, and this is your fitness report. He handed it to me, right? Now this was, um, you know, like I said, it's been months as I was just... As I was a new Christian, I was learning the scripture and I was learning things. And I stand in front of him and he handed me his report. And in his report, he evaluated on all sorts of things, anywhere from being in combat to proficiency, all, all everything that you could think of. There's 12, 15 different categories, and then there's a write up spot. So I looked at it, everything was in the outstanding category, it was the highest mark you can get. Every, every block. Oh no, okay. Thank you, Jesus. And then, and I'm reading it, and he wrote this write-up to me that I was like I, I was Jesus and I walked on water. That's what he wrote. I mean, it was just, um, I'm, I'm like, I couldn't believe what he wrote. And I've known him for a couple of years, so it wasn't like this was, I didn't know him personally. I, I, you know, I knew he was my officer, but I also knew a little bit about his character. And I'm like, I look at him, and I said, sir, do you really believe this, what you wrote? And he said, yes. And I just said, praise the Lord. All right, what do I sign? I signed it, you know, I gave back to him, you know. I was a little bold when I was a new Christian like I am now, so I just kind of like shared, you know, but I did it for God. So I went, my, my work ethics changed because I didn't believe the lie that the enemy kept on telling me I had to perform, 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 perform. When I changed it to my heart, I wanted to do it for God, then my performance just went out the window. I mean, it was just, I did a really excellent job, but my, I had no stress over it. I, had, I was peace in my heart, amen? I mean, and I don't know, you can apply that to anything. You can apply it to your school, your academics, your, your work, your family, everything. Do it for God, and then God will bless that, amen? And don't believe the lie that the enemy is telling you that you're not good enough. Parents, I was thinking about being a parent. I was a parent for a while, still am. Man, I mean, we read books, we saw videos, we were doing all, trying to do all these things to try to, you know, be a good parent, and, you know, what happens when it didn't work out? Then we blame ourselves again, right? And we just, hey, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Kids just, you know, we have wonderful kids, all of them. They all fear God and love Jesus. But you know, sometimes it's hard. Do we homeschool or we send them to public school? What do you do, you know? The enemy is, you know, trying to tell you that you're not good enough, you can't do it. 
uh, being a dad, a father, a husband, you know, is it, uh, I think I did okay so far. Ask Kia if I have or not, but she'll tell you. Um, my good husband, you know, I don't, so I remember as we were married for a couple of years, as I became a new believer, and I gave my life to Jesus and started following him, I remember uh, one of the things I want to know, because we didn't have a bad marriage, you know what I'm saying, because we're just like, we're too dumb, we were 18 years old, we got married, so we didn't know anything, it's like, pay the bills, have dinner, you know, I mean, we had, you know, it was just craziness, and then when Jesus came into our lives, and order came, right? And we tried to figure things out the way God does. So every time I get a Bible, and I, I was just learning about different translations. So we have the NIV, the King James, the ESV, uh, the Phillips translation, the Little Living Bible, all these different translations. Now, every one I go to the same scripture verses in Ephesians, I wanted to read it and find about what, what am I supposed to do as a husband and how is marriage supposed to be according to God, right? Because I didn't want to have like what we had before. I just wanted what God wanted. And enemies like, oh, you're good enough, everything's fine, you're good, you know. Like, no, no, I just need to know. And as we begin to learn, uh, <coughs> our marriage begins to change. Uh, even as a preacher, I tell you, I, w I remember the first time I preached a sermon was in a jail at, in uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina. And I was, oh my goodness, it was the silliest thing ever. Uh, <laughs> You know, they, I went to the jail, and there's guys that were like, it's a county jail, so like there's guys that were in the county jail because they've always been in the county jail. Like they got out, and they'd get back in, drunk and disorderly or whatever, so they'd be in there for a couple days or a week or whatever. So they're like, they knew more about the jail, of course, than I did because I've never been there. But I felt called to go there, and, um, and, <laughs> and, you know, it was a battle because the enemy was telling me, you're just, you don't know nothing, you can't do this, right? I just, I mean, all, I mean, just struggle. Got there and you go through this whole thing that you have to do to get into the jail and get into the cells. And so they have these cells, there, there was like a hallway and it's, these were the cells on this side and the cells on this side. And then I just preached in the middle. That's what I, that's what I did, you know? And the guys go, where's the hymnals? And they go, you gotta sing some songs. They've been in the jail. So every preacher at camp, they had to sing songs. I'm like, ah, nah, I don't sing songs. Everybody that sits on this side knows that, right? So I'm like, I just make a joyful noise. So I got out the hymnals and I was saying Amazing Grace. We're like, that's not too bad, right? Amazing Grace. They were singing louder than I was. And then we sang the, my favorite song, The Old Your Cross. And uh, we'll be singing that every Sunday for the next few No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my kids hated that song because every day I'd just bring out the hymnals. They'd hide the hymnal on me because I wanted to sing the Old Your Cross. I found it in the closet one day up above the, you know, the hats and gloves were one time. Like, so that's where they put it, you know? So it was, it was, uh, they would hide my hymnal on me, you know, saying I can't sing. But I can sing, right? Because the enemy tells me I can't, but I can. And everybody around me will know that I probably can't, but I don't care. I'll sing anyway. Amen. Yeah, somewhere I read that in the scripture. I looked that up. I know. Uh, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, right? And I did. And uh, well, I do. And, and um the guys yesterday at the, the men's retreat, they could sing really good around me, you know? And I was like, wow, I could, maybe I should try to harmonize with this guy behind me because he was singing in my ear anyway. <laughs> it didn't work, but I was just making a joyful noise. We had some great work. 550 men in a room praising God. That was pretty cool. But, um, so I got there and I started preaching to these guys. And, and um, the Lord told me when I, in uh, Luke 4, that I would be preaching to the captive, right? And I remember reading that scripture, and it's okay. Well, Lord, here we go, guys. And uh, it was just, anyway, I, we didn't record, thank God we didn't record it or anything, but uh, it was a wonderful time to see um, God moving in, in, in that little jail cell. So, just in Genesis chapter 1, we see that Satan tried to fool Eve, right? Adam, Adam and Eve were. Um, he, he kind of had the truth, but he just added a little lie there, right? Did God really say this? And you're not supposed to touch the tree or not eat the tree. What was it, you know? What did God really say? And you're going to have knowledge now, right? You're going to have knowledge. You're going to be like God. And it's kind of funny because the, the truth is that Adam and Eve were already like God. Right? So he tried to change 
he flipped the script on, on them and said, no, you, no, God don't want you to have full knowledge. But God already gave you all that. Because we're created, now think about that, you and I are created in God's image. So what are we trying to strive to be like? What does the enemy cause you to say, I have to be this, I have to get my master's degree, and my doctorate, and I gotta do this and that, I'm, what's God really calling you? I mean, don't, go ahead and get your doctorate if you can get it, right? Be the best doctor you can, but know that God gave you that ability to do that, and then be the witness for God in that, amen? If you're in a science department somewhere and everybody hates God because they don't believe in God, they really do believe in God. They just, there's no way you cannot believe in God. And they can be mad about it, but you know what? Your love and your light, you can just shine in that place and it will draw them to God. The person that they think they don't know or don't exist, they're drawn to that. God is drawing many people to Jesus right now. Amen? So, um, <laughs> so we, we, we're always trying to be somebody we're not. Right? Satan's always trying to do this. How many got a Facebook account here? And uh, what's the other one? Um, uh, I don't have that. You got a Snapchat account? You have that? Snapchat, that's for younger guys, I guess. Facebook for me was like amazing. I could connect with like, people all over the world, all my ministry friends, all my military buddies, people we, we were at the church with, all our friends all over the world. It's like really cool. I get to have Facebook with that. But I know, how many post like an ugly picture of themselves on Facebook? <laughs> Not ugly. I mean, just a normal picture on Facebook, right? And I got schooled by Andy the other day because I put some pic pictures on Facebook from uh, an event we had, and he called me like instantly. Dad, that's like a bad picture. It has to look really good. I'm like, it's just a normal picture of us in our living room. What's, what's up with it? But it's going to be on our Facebook account. I didn't tell us to do this. It's on our Facebook. We, we want to have a good image. How many do that, right? We want to have the best, Raj, you talked about you got the best picture of the little, of the little guys, right? With the boys, they look so, you know, they've got matching shirts on. They look just perfect, right? We don't want us to have a bad picture. We don't have them with their hair all messed. Or, you know, we don't, everything on Facebook is like just a facade, right? It's like, okay, this is what we think we should look like, right? We kind of have this big image. Or how about uh, Snapchat? Now, I'm not familiar with that. Do you get to uh, tell me about Snapchat? You get just uh, pictures, right, of what's going on, right? Just like Facebook? Um, Instagram. Or Instagram. Instagram, right? So we, and Instagram, we don't want, it's got to be perfect too, right? It has to be a professional picture because we don't want it to look bad as a church, right? Or as a as a camera. As a person, we want our, we want the best. Most we want the most like. How many want like? How many to go to your picture and then you see? Wow, I had seventy five likes on my picture today, <laughs> right? Do you check that, or am I the only one that did? <laughs> you do that? Yeah. Like I'll take, like I'll send a picture of Tina and I when we were traveling. I'll get we'll just have like these. We do these selfies. We're not really good at, it, but we like do them wherever, wherever we go. So one trip we just did, um, we stopped at every at every city that we went in through from here to Minnesota. So every little town had a little sign that said we're in this town. That's so we get out of the car and take a picture. Of it. <laughs> but I know we have, yeah, and I know Rajik has one of those selfie sticks. I'm getting one of those things because then you can actually get a good picture, right? So it'd be a little bit better. So we have this, you know, we have this image. We want this, we want to portray an image that is really not who we are. Just, but just for that moment, right? In time, we want everybody to look good, right? We have this, we value, our value becomes how many likes we have, or how many people, you know, commented on our picture or our situation, and our worth is now on this little computer, and it's like everything is like right there, right? I was thinking about, um, um, uh, like how we, this image, like how we have to have this image all the time, it's like this is not even real, right? Even and So I had to go back and reevaluate my Facebook account, like I went through and looked at it. Like all the things I've been posting, like hated bad, there's one yesterday, right? So we're like going to post that on there, uh, you know, or me and Tina's doing something, or there was the Mitchell Community Group, that was the bad picture, I guess, we didn't have, wasn't focused, I guess. Click, that looked good. I was thinking about David, when David got called to the ministry. Do you remember when they, when King Saul called they, uh, went to uh, um, David's home and, and not Saul, Samuel, 
you got Samuel the prophet went to uh, anoint David as king. You remember what happened? So we find out that this is kind of my version of it. So, I, so we find out that the, the prophet's coming to, to anoint somebody king. They don't even know that because Saul's already lost the anointing. And so we, Israel needs a new king. And so the prophet by God said, went and said, go to this house. So you can imagine, a prophet's coming to your house to anoint one of your sons king, right? So, yeah, I mean, you would, you would have to, you would clean the house up, right? You would clean the house, I think the tent was all swept out. Um, they, they probably killed a couple of fat calves, you know, whatever, some lambs. And, you know, they had some stew made. I mean, they had this whole thing decked up. All the boys, right? They had their Sunday best on, right? They had, I mean, they had their hair cut, their beards were trimmed. Right, we had this beer contest yesterday. I didn't win. Um, they had a guy who had a beard like this. Wow. Next year, I'm growing a beard like this. Anyway, so they were all trimmed up. They had their Sunday best on. They were looking good, right? And then from the oldest to the youngest, right? They prayed before the the, um, the prophet, right? No, you, hey, the, the first boy, right? He looked good. He was tall, 6'4", right? Maybe a little taller, right? Looking good. This guy would be the king. He looks like a king. Nope. Next boy. Nope. Nope. Right now, all those boys, right? And then the prophet says, that, is there anyone else in your family? Because he knew from God. He heard from God, right? So he, he didn't know how many sons they had. He just heard from God to go to this household, go to this man, see his family, and there's the king, right? You got anybody else? They go, yes. There's a, we got a little runt guy. He's out there tending the sheep because somebody has to watch the sheep. So this is what I think happened. This is my version of it. Um, so I think the dad told, sent the older boy out to watch the sheep for David to come in. <laughs> That's what I think. You know, I think, hey, you know, you didn't make it, so go tend the sheep. And then David comes and God anoints him. See, so God took, you know, kind of, you know, what we think is should be righteous or holiness because we hear from the enemy. God just changes that and flips that over and says, no, I'm going to take what's not the best. I'm going to do, I'm going to take you, you know, you don't feel good or you don't feel like you're worthy, and I'm going to take you and I'm going to use you for my kingdom. Amen? He, so he took David, of course, we know the story about David. I'm not sure, I, got, I, talk, I called Jackie the other day. I said, hey, Jackie, can I use your story uh, on Sunday? She said, yes, that was really nice because um, we went in our church, you know, in our missional community groups, we're kind of like being real real, you know, like sharing our life story with each other. And you guys are, is everybody part of a missional community? If you're not part of a missional community, get, be a part of a missional community. All right, just get involved. We are changing our, the way we look at everything about Christianity. It's like not coming to church. I was talking to a gentleman yesterday. Um, at the football field, I just just met him. Hi, you know, I'm sharing how we were. He's trying to share about his church, what's happening, and and I'm sharing about our church, what's happening. And he's like, wow, that's really interesting because he, you know, he's all about you know showing up on Sunday. That's the whole the whole thing. His whole life is Sunday morning serving. As he he was serving as an usher, he thought that was really good, you know. And now he's doing ministry, he's serving an usher. And I said, look. You know, and I started to share with some things that we're doing. I didn't say what he was doing wrong and it was bad. I just was sharing what we were doing. Like, we're really seeing people's life change. And God, um, God's really doing some great things. So Jackie shared with us um, recently that she was so mad at God. She just hated God. Right, Jackie? We were mad. And she, came to our, she was coming to our mission community. And the enemy had just messed in her head so much how he didn't like her, how she wasn't good enough. How her family all messed up, and just she just kept believing these these, these untruths about her family and everything. And um, she had a brother that uh, she had some brothers uh, that uh, got in a car accident, that died. Uh, father passed away all in a, in a short period of time. So now she's mad at God because she's taking God's God right. God took your family away is what she said, and that's not true, is it? Right? It's not true. And she learned over just by loving her and sharing with her that those lies that she believed, it took a long time, right, Jackie? It took a long time to say, you know, to understand and asking questions and sharing scripture that, you know, God loves her and, and, and uh, believe that she's a, a daughter of God and that she has just as much worth as anybody else in the church family. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. And she has worth and value. And, and she didn't hear that for a long time. She's been working hard, taking care of her mom and stuff, and just, you know, really not taking care of herself and, you know, or anything about herself. She's just a giver. She just gives and serves and does that for her family. And it's just amazing when you get to know Jackie. She's an amazing person. And she has some health issues. We've been praying for that, right? We look and say, Jackie, you're healed. She'll come to the Bible and say, all oh, in pain. I'm like, no. Yes. And she comes there. She pushes through, yes. believing uh, what God can do for her. And so, Jackie, for many years, um, even after she said yes to Jesus, that she would start following Jesus, even then she still wasn't sure about it. Uh, she wanted to follow Jesus. She wanted to serve him. But then she still had this hatred from her, her uh, toward God because of her family. And then God was slowly begin to soften her heart, right? And can show like, how, how much she's worth to him. And, and then started we started actually rebuking the enemy. You know, and saying you don't have any authority over that any longer. Those lies she's not gonna believe any longer. We believe that she's a child of God, she's a daughter of God, she's righteous and she's holy. Amen. And then the breakthrough came. Amen. And God and, and Jackie uh, is free from a lot of that burden because now she believes the truth about God. Amen. That's happening right here in our church family. So Satan says, you, you, you don't have what it takes to be a Christian even to her. And she says, now she can say, no, I am. And I believe that. Satan told her, she, you know, she has no value. But then she began to rebuke that and say, no, I believe the truth. That I can have life and life more abundantly. Amen. And so that began to change in her life. And we're so happy for her. I was going to share um, a, little, a little bit of um, my story. Um. Uh, when I became a believer, and um, even after I got called into ministry, I want to share a couple of verses with you. Let's turn, if you don't mind, to Luke four eighteen. Some of you might already know that one, and this is what I remember the day and the moment that I was reading the scripture and God called me into ministry, and then I believed that I couldn't do it. So 418, and I think um, Linda actually shared this out as Isaiah the other day, last weekend, so it's kind of interesting. But I was reading in, in the Bible as a new believer, right before I went to that jail ministry, I was reading, because I knew if I could read through the script, I would understand what God called me to do, because I felt like God called me more than just being a church goer. And so this is what happened. I was reading this. It says, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. And I still have it underlined in this Bible. And he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and receive recovery to the sight of the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I remember sitting there in my, in my, uh, in my I think I was sitting at the table studying, and I was reading this. And the Lord said, this is for me. But then I thought, so I thought this was just for me. I didn't know it was talking about Jesus because I was so new in the Lord. I didn't know this was about Jesus, right? You ever read the Bible and you're like, wow, that's for me? You ever, you ever do that? And like, wow, God's speaking to me through the word, right? And this is what happened that day. And Revelation said, hey, God said this. So then immediately uh, afterwards, because I started studying and stuff, I just had trouble. Who's ever had trouble in this? Probably nobody in this church. Ever had trouble in school? Like, like, I know some of you are A students. I was not that person. Yeah. So, I know some of you are like B students, right? Like you get B. Like I got a B and I thought I was I have a holiday, you know what I'm saying? I was like amazing, right? I was not that student. I never was, right? So I thought, how could God call me to be a preacher and bring me to Madison, Wisconsin when most of the people have not only one degree but two degrees in this area? And the Lord told me one day, he said, I mean, this is like I'm talking to you now. They don't know me. They don't know me. So you, they can be great scientists. They can be great, whatever, computer programmers or whatever, you know, whatever your field is. But they don't know me. So my heart, my, desire, my calling is to give, put a desire into you to, to follow Jesus. But the enemy will say, well, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. I hear this all the time. And I say, no, God called me to do this work back in 1984. 
And I, uh, I'll, let me share a couple more uh, scriptures. 2 Corinthians 3.5, this is another one that um, changes the script of what the enemy tries to tell me. Hopefully this will help minister to you also. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are confident in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our um, confidence comes from who? God. So I might not be able to do this, or you might not be able to do what you're doing, but the enemy just has to do it. It comes from God. Everything that you have comes from God. Look at uh, Philippians 1. Turn over to Philippians. One, three through six. I thank my God every time I remember you. In my in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of the Lord, until, until the day of, of Christ Jesus. So until Jesus comes back, God's going to complete the work that's already in us. Amen? So I can say, hey, I might not be perfect in all this, but I'm going to keep doing it because I know God's given me the ability to do it. Amen? And I'm not going to believe the lie that I can't do it, right? I think it's kind of funny. I, 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 I joke about it now because I, it would make, it make me angry when I can't uh, spell a word. How many have trouble spelling words sometimes? I grew up in the lane. I grew up in, uh, in a system that was whole language. Anybody hear that before? So instead of teaching us how words sounded when I was in elementary and middle or uh, low level schools, we used the whole word. So we never learned vowels and consonant sounds. Uh -huh. So my even my sister, we went through the same school system. So even now we have troubles. Uh, uh, I'm admitting to you, uh, my fault. Is that okay? Yeah. So I call Tina a lot. Hey Tina, how do you spell this word? And I got spell checker on my computer, which is amazing because I just love that. But then when you spell the wrong when you spell the wrong word, then it's like you got the wrong word in a sentence. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the difference because the word sound looks the same. So I, I have to practice that all the time. Right? Even today I have that trouble. No, I you probably don't have that trouble, right? Everybody has spell check or just, you know what I'm saying? So that school system it was an experimental school system they did for a while in the in the city in the seventies. That was part of what how I grew up. So when I went to by the time we got to middle school, I couldn't even read in middle school. Like anything. So then I'm learning to read in middle school, and then I went to high school, and I don't know how I passed high school, but anyway, I did. Only by the grace of God, right? But I did. And uh, so in, in high school to graduate, do, you, do they have that now? Does anybody know that? But in high school, you have to have like four English classes, or three English classes, four math classes. You know, they have some kind of requirement. In my school, they had the same thing. You had to have uh, four math classes, which I did well in. And you had to have four English classes, right? But it was cool because some of the English classes was like English ninth grade, English tenth grade, right? Then they had eleventh to twelfth grade, or they had college English if you were that good, you took college English. And, but they also had this way you could kind of get out of that, and that's why I took, right? Took the easy route. So you could have, you could take drama, <laughs> and that counted as an English credit. So I had to memorize scripts. I could do that. And we had little plays that we had to do, and I was involved with that, you know. And, uh, you know, I was actually in a couple school plays, believe it or not. Like, uh, I was a police officer, and uh, what, was the, what was the, I don't remember the name of the song. This, this, something dark. Yeah, anyway, it was, I had no words to speak. I just walked out on stage at the end of the play. That was, that was pretty good. That was a script. That was a script, you know. I could do that. Anyway, it was just a fun, uh, that's where I met Tina anyway. And, uh, Backstage. What's we'll last source one time? <laughs> <laughs> so I would just get angry at myself. I just get mad and couldn't do certain things. And then I realized as I became a believer, even as a believer, the enemy would tell you, you can't do this, you can't do this. And I'm like, and as I read the scripture more and more, I knew that God called me and God set me to do this and He's going to equip me to do it. And He has, amen. 
and we see some miraculous things happen in our lives from doing street ministry to coming even to Madison, Wisconsin and being accepted to be pastor here is just amazing to me. So I know that um, when God calls you to do something, you can do something more than you can for yourself. Amen? Enemy will tell you you can't do it, but God's word says you can. Amen? And you got to flip that script and, and realize that there's power in the word of God. Praise the Lord. So I want to, um, we're going to end with this today. What, what is the enemy, I guess we have to value that. What is the enemy telling you about your life that you're not able to do? And what does God's word say about you that will get, make you accomplish that for his kingdom? I mean, I can't even do life without God, for one. Well, it's a lot easier with him than without him. Amen? It's a lot easier to know that my Father loves me and that Jesus is making intercession for me and that the Holy Spirit is here to guide me. So that's another thing. If we believe in John 10, 10, it says, The enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy, but Christ has come to give you life more, abund life more abundantly. He's giving that life in the Spirit. And the Spirit is going to lead you to what? All truth. Amen? So even though things don't look right, or even though I don't feel worthy, I'm still part of his kingdom. Amen? Even though maybe my situation isn't perfect. Like, I went into the office and received a report. I mean, I, he could have, it could have just been the opposite. He could have hated me and wrote all these bad things, but guess what? My salvation wasn't in that report. My salvation was in Jesus. Amen? My hope is in Him, Him alone. So how many feel like sometimes the enemy is just like telling you stuff that you're not good enough, and you're not worthy, and you got sin in your life, and you're, you're like, um, <clears throat> how can you do that? You're not even qualified to be that person. Huh? But the truth this morning is, if we flip the script, if you will, if we actually read the script, and read and and say, okay, God, the enemy, yeah, you might, I might uh, not be the best oracle person or the best preacher or whatever, but you know what? I'm called because your word tells me. Sure. Amen? Your spirit confirms it. I know what I'm doing. Amen? And I'm going to help lead people to a deeper relationship with Him because if we fall in love with Him, oh my goodness, life is so much better. How many want to just be happy all the time? Yeah. How, how many would like to just be happy in tragedy? <clears throat> You know, what are you talking about? I mean, things are going to happen in our lives. We're in this world. Things are going to go wrong. But when they go wrong, there's such a, we can just change it just so easy. Like, okay, God, you got this. Right? Help me to trust you. Help me to believe in you. Help me to continue to have faith in you. And see the, the glory of God happen in that situation over, oh my God, the fear and the worry and all the stuff that happens in our lives. 